Okay, so this is State of Mind. And uh, by, by the time you see this, we would have hit 100,000 subscriptions. It's been, it's been tough, but I couldn't have done it without the audience. So thank you. And I will, when I get the plaque, I'm going to put it here, but I'm going to do a, a thing with you guys. And it's going to be great. Um, so today I have someone who, you know, when I first started acting, I kind of watched him. He's one, I would say, the or one of the biggest stars that's ever been on Days of Our Lives. I think, and I'm sure a lot of people think. Um, he, I saw a scene he did hmm. on just a, it's probably, it, it was just a scene where I think he died and came back. I don't know, maybe that, he was on a beach and then somebody came up, an actress, and I was waiting to see the kind of actor, what he would do. Because a lot of actors overdo it. And when I saw how he played it, it was so natural and real. I said, damn. All right. Right on. I love that. Because it could have been. <gasps> what happened? Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, let me just introduce you to Teo Penglis right now. How are you, brother? I'm good. It's nice to see you outside of the studio. It is nice. Yeah. It is nice. Yeah. Um, tell me. And that death scene. That is I it what? Like, what you, I've, I've done it seven times. I mean, I've done oh, it seven times. Do you remember on the beach and somebody came up and said, <gasps> Yes. Yeah, with Leanne Hunley. Yeah. Andrew Hall. Yes, they yes. were both there, right. Right. I hope it was simple. It was very simple. Yes. And you and but it was not just simple because simple would kind of uh, mean that you were, it was kind of boring or something, but it wasn't. You kind of even laughed, oh. which was interesting to me. I mean, it's just a, a scene that I well, you know how it is. You try to be spontaneous because yeah. we've got one take, right? Basically, yeah, one rehearsal, that's one a, take. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the fact that we get it out to me is always a miracle. <laughs> you know, I always think to myself, oh, how did that? I go home, not too often, but I go home so exhausted from trying just to remember the dialogue because yeah. I used to love giving me monologues. And then I said one day after a five-page monologue, do you think we could cut some of that dialogue down? Yeah. Headwriter took offense to it, the previous one, and <laughs> stopped writing for me. Really? Yes, they don't, I don't think they like to be... Yes, in any way. but don't you think that they give monologues to the people that can do them? Yes, and I, the reason why I did monologues pretty well, I think, was because uh, studying in Milton's class. Yeah, I want to talk about, yeah. Yeah, studying in his class, I had no time to rehearse with anybody, so the only thing I had time for was to learn lines for a monologue and go into class and do it. So I studied with him, I was his assistant for 10 years. Wow. I studied with him for almost 40. So... Um, I became, you know, secondhand when it came to monologues. How do you make it real? So I remember a producer used to send some of the young student, young actors down just to look at some monologues. How do you make it real, you know, without looking like you're going insane? Yeah. You know, so he, he was, that was a great uh, exercise for me. Now, he, he's taught... Biggies. Yeah. Real biggies, yeah. Who's the, like, because the, I... Re well, um... Well, he directed Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton in Private Lives. Um, he won. He was nominated for a Tony for Butterflies Are Free on Broadway, Dang. and also he was the original. Because I, I look at you, and I would say you would probably do that, which was uh, the Zoo Story. Oh my! Right, that would be something for you. And Milton was the original director for Zoo Story. Let me tell you a Zoo Story. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm going to get emotional here. I studied with Howard Fine. Uh-huh. Okay. And he would call me 
arrogantly ignorant or ignorant arrogant right because i you know i had a lot of talent but i would i wouldn't do what he wanted me to do so one time i we did a scene from zoo story huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. and i'm in the I'm in. I'm on the floor. I on a park bench or something, yeah. and I start to see, and I start crying. But it had nothing to do with the play. So he stopped it at about a minute in, and he goes, "Why are you crying?" I said, "Well, because I think that he goes that is the worst acting I've ever seen, and I'm kicking you out of class." You're not coming back and wait for me after class. I don't want to talk to you. Now, Teo, I was so freaking embarrassed and, you know, hurt and ashamed. So everybody, all the actors left class and I sat with him and he goes, everybody knows your talent is here, but your technique is horrible. I know you don't have any money, but I will teach you privately for free and you pay me back when you want. So I went with him for four months in, with a tape recorder and learned technique. And then when I got General Hospital, I paid him back. Mm. You know, And it was a beautiful exchange at a lunch. But that Zeus story, how you brought that up. Isn't is that interesting? That I perceive that. I, I think um, working with Katsellas um, developed my perceptions. That was one of the things I realized. My intuition, how you sharpen those tools. But um, I remember we were direct, he was directing uh, PSU Cat is Dead. And uh, with Keir DeLay and um, what's the actor from East of Eden? Um, uh, James Dean? No, the other one. Uh, um the dark head. Um, oh, God. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Did people used to say I look like yeah. Sal Minio? Sal Minio. Yeah. Uh, I was with Sal Minio the night he was murdered. No! Yeah. I'll give you an exclusive. Yes. Uh, uh, he was, uh, we were rehearsing, and I was assisting Milton. So Milton said to me, would you make that Greek lemon soup you make for us? Because we're going to rehearse into the night. I said, sure. So I, I went into the kitchen, and, and we were at the... Um, Westwood Playhouse, which is the Geffen now, and I made my Greek lemon soup, and that was his last meal. And when we finished, uh, we had to go to class. So I went with Knowlton, and then at 11 o'clock at night, I remember I turned on the television, and he had been murdered. What the... It was su such a shocking... Cause Wasn't he was stabbed? Yes. He, he came out of his car. Someone was waiting to rob whoever it was in the garage. There was an open garage in West Hollywood, and... Uh, I remember um, the guy came flying at him with the, the knife and stabbed him right in the heart, burst. But they didn't know who killed him until years later when the guy confessed in prison for something else that he did. But he was such a wonderful, wonderful guy. And um, anyway, we replaced him, but it was, it was one of those times where uh, you, you realise the fragility of life, you know. You, yes. Here you are. Who, who would have known that that was the last meal he was going to have? And, um, and Milton and I used to, you know, used to talk about it. But um, And then Milton died about 10 years ago. But he was such an influence for me. But, you know, when I first came into class, he, he was, had mentioned that uh, why I wanted to be an actor because he thought it's how I was a dilettante. He said, you know, the way you dress and everything... It, to kind of dabble in things. Right, and right. I said, you see this suit? I said, it's the only suit I have. And I said, and it's been given to me because I was in the fashion world. My boss said, you should wear something nice in the shop. So he made this suit for me. I said, and if you think because I dabble in the arts, I said, if I come off looking rich or being, it's because I was brought up well. Yeah. And I said, and so uh, two years later, he asked me to be his assistant and I said, no. And he said, no. I said, no, I'm not. I don't want to be your assistant. He goes, why not? I says, because I don't like you. He says, you don't <laughs> like me. And then he said, do you know who I am? Do you know who I was the assistant to? 
He said, when I was growing up, I was assistant to who directed, had my brain this morning, uh, who directed uh, Streetcar? Um, uh, Ali, uh, Elia Kazan. Elia Kazan, yeah. He says, I was Elia Kazan's assistant. Now you're going to be mine. You know what that means? Wow. So anyway, I assisted him for over 10 years and did a lot of things together. Um, and then I got into daytime because there was a strike and I had done altered states in 1980, then the strike came, and then I ended up on General Hospital, and I was the first English accent speaking person because at the beginnings they were saying Americans are not going to want daytime have English accents. They want to hear Americans. You know. So, so you were on General Hospital creating the at what? But I, w- I was nowhere near there at uh, that time. This was the time Gloria Monti. Oh, Gloria Monti. Yeah. She was great. I got along really well with her. And how long did you do that for? It was three months, and then they had 30 people that summer, and so they axed, axed everybody, and then she called me in. So she said to me, so what is it like to be the only actor that's going to be saved this summer? And I said, oh. She said, I see potential. And I said, oh, okay. So uh, with Tristan Rogers was there. Yeah, he was, think, he was I here. don't think Tristan liked me at the time because I was Australian. I was competition at that time, having another Australian come on board. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen. <laughs> but, yeah, so it, it, was, um, it, was, it was a good run. And then Pat Falcon smith who was the writer uh, uh, there, uh, said, I want you to come over to Days. And that's why I went. 40 years on Days. Yeah, on and off 40 years, yeah. Um, why on and off so much? Well, I went, uh, I, I did. What makes you leave? I left once, uh, and I ran out of money. Ah. Uh, Yes, that's happened to me a couple of times. Uh, because I wanted to take journeys. I, ah. my, the idea of being an actor to me was to make enough money to take journeys. Yeah. And the journeys I took were one of the best influences for my acting because I understood other cultures other than my own. Yeah. So I went to Egypt 14 times. No! Yeah. Let's t- I, need to, I need to get into this. Oh, Egypt, What's I Egypt? Know. Please tell me what that's like. Because I don't travel. Because I, I'm, I, well, I used to have bad anxiety. Didn't get on a plane for ten years, and I had to. I got off two planes. It's a, it's a, it's terrible. So, I want, I want to travel with you right now. Okay. Can we do that? Yeah, anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Take me to Egypt. Okay. When I was twenty six, that decade is where we plant all our seeds for all, all those who have had mentors. Uh, you plant those seeds, and those uh, those seeds you plant in your 20s is what I still use today. So as I always wanted a journey, Egypt, because of I loved history, my boss said to me, I've been to Egypt nine times. He was um, a designer uh, in New York. He said, but I need to see it through fresh eyes. So I want you to be my assistant and come to Egypt with me. And I did. I took an acid trip on a camel, actually. No! Yeah, yeah, I did. The only time I ever did that. I took an acid trip on a camel. It happened to be an extraordinary day. There we now, went. where are you at in Egypt? You're in the right. desert? No, yeah. Well, firstly, you go to Cairo, and then a half an hour outside of Cairo is where the three Damn. pyramids are. So uh, there was a... Yeah, the pyramids. My, yeah, so my guide said to me, that I just got a call. They've just found a tomb tomb of Mer, 2340 BC, and in Saqqara, which they're finding all those discoveries now, would you like to come and, and be the first to walk through? Because I was telling him how much oh. excited I was. He didn't know I was on acid. And I have to tell you, everything was so intense. Uh, I didn't feel insecure at all. Nothing, uh, no, nothing in my mind became, came up that I would felt threatened with. So we went to the tomb, and they opened the door, and I was the first person to walk in there after 4,000 years. No! Yes. And I said to him, can I go into this room? He says, why? I said, I don't know. I'd like to do a meditation in here. And so he said, no, by all means, you know. So I went in, and uh, I did my meditation. I was sitting, uh, uh, and then suddenly my hand started to move in, in the meditation. And I pulled out this beautiful necklace with semi-precious stones, and on the other hand, I found a piece of mummified cloth with Jack, no Jackman's jewelry. No, tail. Yeah, I should have brought you some pictures. But anyway. We'll I, put the pictures up when we put this up. Okay. But uh, go ahead, keep going. So I, I, I went to, um, 
I heard them coming and I thought, because, you know, I've heard stories about how they arrest you in Egypt and throw you in jail for a year and, and no questions asked. So I said to him, I just found these things, what shall I do? And um, I covered the necklace. But I, he said, oh, you can take the mummified cloth. I remember walking to customs and uh, I paid somebody. He said, give me £10. I gave £10 and they just let us go through. I still have it. Wow. I brought it with me. But I have a few Egyptian pieces uh, through the years that I've collected. Um, but when I came out, uh, I don't know what happened to me, but as we were sitting in the back of the car, I started to sob. And he said, what's the matter? I, yeah, I said, I, I don't know. I said, I feel like I've been here before. And, uh, and he goes, oh, oh, okay. So that was my first trip. The second trip, I didn't want to go back because I felt it was dangerous at times. Um, I was young and, and um, they tried to, you know, they, people tried to seduce you for the wrong reasons oh. and um, entrap you. Um, anyway, so, um, but once I got used to it and made friends, I, you know, one of the ways you, you get a good guide is you tip him well. If he's yeah. a good guide, you tip him well. Yeah. And he'll make sure you go to the best places all the new discoveries and all that. So I went there 14 times. And then when they did my DNA, I found out that my great-great-grandparents came from Alexandria. No. And I never knew that the Egyptian side of me was, was there so because what I realised is that uh, I'm 48% Italian Greek and the rest is Tunisia and Turkey. So all that uh, Middle Eastern area. That's why I've been so attracted going to the Middle East and... Um, what about the pyramids? I've been inside of them. I wouldn't go back inside. It's rather claustrophobic. Ooh, can't do it. Oh, my God. Well, you have to... Uh, the but Ke what do you Cheops, mean? Cheops, which is the biggest yeah. one. Yeah. And then there's Khafre and Menakoi. Cheops, when you go through up, you have to bend all the way up. Oh, no, no, And then no, there's no. another turn. The, the Khafre that joins the, pyra the um, Sphinx, which they say... Uh, there is a tunnel supposedly underground there that joins that, and that's where a, lo a lot of history is is, is hidden. Um, I said, um, "Can we go into the Sphinx?" And uh, they said, "No, no, there's nothing there." And yet, years later, when I was wo I worked with Omar Sharif, Omar Sharif did a documentary, and they went inside the Sphinx. There's a tomb in there. Really? Down there. Oh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Now, Omar Sharif, my mom loved him. Oh. And she said that my eyes were kind of like Omar Sharif. Yeah, I could tell. Said right? That. Yeah. How was he? Well, when he first came, um, I was playing his brother-in-law, and it was Memories of Midnight, a mini four-hour miniseries. And uh, he said to me, I, um, he came in, and I said, oh, hello. And he was very cool, not interested. So then we came in, he says, listen to me, he says, I want you to know that when I hit you, I, when you go flying over that table, it's 18th century, please do not break it. Find a way of falling over that table, but don't break it. I said, I'm not falling anywhere. He says, what? I said, I'm not falling anywhere. He said, what, what do you mean? I said, if you hit me and I go flying, you and I have nowhere else to go in this. Right. There's no challenge. Well, from that moment, <laughs> he hugged me. He said, would you like some champagne? Would you like some caviar? Yeah. So I had six weeks of Omar Sharif telling me stories. You know? No! Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah, I just had a great time with him. Now the he even invited me to Paris. Really? Yeah, yeah. Listen, I can tell you, I've had some of the most, uh, the people that have crossed my path, even Sir John Gilgood. Uh, 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 probably... Uh, I'm like a kid in a candy store right ja now. Jacqueline Kennedy. I had tea with her. I was studying when I was 21. The only way I could work was because um, uh, I knew Chinese history and, uh, and 18th century English history. And so I got a job at $75 a week as an apprentice in the best gallery in New York. And then one day there was a knock on the door. It was a private gallery. My, my boss, who was a prick, um, <laughs> left to have lunch. And uh, there was a knock on the door, and it was Jacqueline Kennedy with the bodyguards. And she said, I'm terribly sorry, I don't have an appointment, but do you mind if you show me around? And I said, oh, by all means. So as she came in, I said to her, would you like a cup of tea? And she goes, oh, I'd love a cup of tea. So I spent an hour with her 
in the, in the back gallery, which had the best collection of Southeast Asian sculpture. And I sat with her for over an hour talking about Greeks, Greek history, life. I mean, she was just... Now, was, answer yeah. me something, Teo. You could do this because you're so educated. Like, I'm thinking of myself. Mm. I would be intimidated because I don't... I, the only thing I have is street smarts. But you have worldly thing, you know, intelligence and, you know... Is that why you can get along with so many different types of people of that stature? Oh, uh, I, I, I don't get intimidated. Yes, that I don't know if, yeah, I would be intimidated. And the thing is, um, when I was in my late teens, I joined the diplomatic corps in Sydney, in Australia. I thought, well, I might as well, my, my parents wanted me, you know, I was the eldest son, and so they wanted a, a good education for me. So I, I got a job there. Um, it was a wonderful job, except there were a few crooks that were taking money from immigrants to come in quickly with their uh, applications. Um, but it was such an education in dealing with people on a daily basis and sharpening my tools as far as who's telling me the truth, who's, uh, who's trying to cheat me in some way. And so I took that kind of diplomacy with me to America First, they thought it was arrogance. Yeah, 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 you know right. I mean? So I, I was reading just recently that People who think you're arrogant, because this is the year of the monkey, uh, the year of the rabbit in the Chinese astrology, and and I'm the year of uh, for me it's uh, I'm a, um, I'm the monkey. Okay. And they say at times will take your arrogance, it's instead of your confidence. So how do you build your confidence? How do you sharpen your spine? Yes. You know, yeah. You, and the thing is, you act it out. Uh, you know, you can be very insecure, be nervous about something. I do when you go into an audition. You know what that's like. Exactly. Oh, yeah. But through all those experiences and all those cultures, entertaining, because I like to cook, entertaining people gave me the confidence that I, I was enough. Yes. Was enough. Yes. And now my story is you have an arc in life. And, you know, you begin, and then one day you realize the arc is kind of complete, and you can now turn around and watch other people. You don't have to keep registering for yourself and thinking that I do. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. You're enough. So that's where I'm at now. And so, and uh, my, my best time, and yet I'm not appreciated enough in the work I do um, with what I know uh, you know, these are the times where you say, I've learned all this, like when I used to be, and when I had mentors, they knew. And then I became the mentor. And then I said, well, where do I put this knowledge? And you want to put it in your acting because that's what you do. Yeah. So I have now, I've got two books that have been published. And so I, I thought, oh, then I'm going to continue the writing. And that's yeah. what I'm doing now. I'm doing a podcast, um, which is... Um, finished now they're putting the sound effects in they're almost complete i just did a synopsis on it and it's called the lost treasures and it's all about finding treasures in life not necessarily have to be gold but it's a trilogy on homer who the trojan war the treasures that were found in troy the treasures that were found in greece right by schliemann and also this past year i i met with this uh, incredible um scholar from england who took me on a new journey of where Ulysses truly is. Not the Ithaca of today, where they say that's where he was, the Ithaca of yesteryear. And so I explored all that, and that became the third part of the trilogy, and I just finished that. So, anyway. Wow. Um, where, I ask this to everybody who, because they give me an answer, but I want to hear your answer. Where are the best beaches in the world? Well, it's interesting because uh, I was looking at that this past year, and they said that in the island of Kefalonia in Greece, the two most beautiful beaches in the world are there. Oh, in Greece? In Greece. Yes, I've heard that. Yes, and um, really brutal. I mean, the, the rips that happen there. So people don't usually go in swimming because it's too dangerous, okay. but they're stunning. But in Sydney, I mean, those beaches, because I, I'm sitting at the edge of a cliff in Sydney and these ancient rocks, and I'm looking at this ocean, 
It's so green and so blue wow. and all the white foam, not like here in Santa Monica where everything's grey. Yeah. It is so magnificent, I mean, to get into that water because, let's face it, when you face the water, my spiritual counsellor used to say to me, if you're feeling too important, yeah. why don't you go and stand in front of the ocean and see how small you are? <laughs> yeah. So to, you know, you know, people say Cancun. Look, I want why Puerto. I, I used to go to Puerto Rico a lot, and I loved it there. And the it was the water was warm and it was nice. Caribbean, uh, yeah. I like white sands, the water not cold. You know that it looks blue and that you can see on the. Th well, that's the Caribbean. That's the Caribbean. If you go to Sydney, and it's hot outside, but you want to go into that water where it's cool. Ah, uh, so you have the contrast. You come out feeling exhilarated yeah yeah that. yeah so it's um you know i asked tristan rogers about <laughs> <laughs> he's a good guy he is a good guy he's funny too i asked him about australia because I, I was just like i'm just interested in animals mm -hmm. so i wanted to hear about koalas and but he looked he looked at me like i had two heads <laughs> why he doesn't like koalas well i guess it was like I don't know that he, I don't think he got offended. I just thought like, he's like, why are you asking me about animals in Australia on this podcast? Right. Um, but I'm kind of like. Well, it's part of the environment. He was yeah. Right. yeah. I, and, and if I went to Australia, I'd want to see koalas and kangaroos and the cockatoos flying. Is that, is that, could I, could I see that? At night. Yeah. When they, around at sunset, thousands of cockatoos. Damn. Flying across Sydney. Landing in, in the parks. In yeah. The About three hours later, thousands of, of um, what do you call it? Um, those things are upside down. Oh, the bats? Bats. Oh, I don't like in. that. Oof. They fly in. Yeah. It's just a black mass. No. Oh. Yeah. I mean, the, the one thing, you know, originally, millions of years ago, Australia and South America were together. Yeah. And it separated. Yeah. That's why we have strange animals and the way they developed. The same with, you know, the Amazon. You know, they're all very unusual. Uh, koala bear. I hosted a show in in Sydney mid, called the Midday Show. It was an hour and a half. I did it for a week, and my first guest was a koala. So I had a koala sitting with me Dang. while I was interviewing. People. How are they? They. You smell the eucalyptus. Yeah, you know, that's all they eat, and they're sweet. Oh, they're so sweet and everything. But if you go into the wild, they could just castrate you. Oh, really? Got such claws. Oh, yes. Those are the big ones. Oh, they're not just all cuddly, right? But, but the ones that are trained and you know. And then kangaroos, the box and stuff. Oh, well, isn't that something? Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. There's one piece of film where a. a this kangaroo is coming up to this guy to box him and he's putting out his fist yeah. and everything and the guy just punched the saw, kangaroo. That's right not the cool, but man. No, you, that was very funny. I mean, but you got to, you know, to protect yourself. Well, you yourself. see, that's why they have that, that strong tail. They, yes. The way they do it, they lean back on the tail and then they spring forward. Yeah, and they could hurt you. Kill you. Yeah. Um, there's something that you wrote that I liked a lot. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to... And may, I hope he wrote it because then I'm going <laughs> to say it wrong. It's just, and I want you to let me know what you think. Once I only dreamed of the life I am now. No, no. Damn it. I can't do it as well as you, but I'm going to oh. try it again. Once I only dreamed of the life I am now living, maybe I can remind people that the best does exist and can if only we take the time. Uh, where did you find that? <laughs> <laughs> you're a spy, are you? <laughs> but you did write it or not? Yeah. It's beautiful, man. Well, I, I think, you know, when I said about planting seeds in your 20s, I, I went into the art world, I went into the fashion world, I, w yeah. I went in t into metaphysics. Uh, and, and of course I went into the acting. But 
all that became part of a package. And um, all those places I've been to, including Jordan that I love, it, it, if, it, if you allow it and to be present with it, it allows you to sharpen your insights. And it's amazing what, what we know within that we can't reveal ourselves because it, we have been shut off through emotions, through rejection. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So that's what I'm talking about. It takes a lifetime to have the confidence yeah. to be able to face these things. And when fear appears, uh, people can do, we can do, all of us have, can do strange things, you know. The mind can play games. Yeah. And, and just uh, overnight, you can have these thoughts that keep running through. So I, can I swear? No. Yeah. Yeah, because I'll, I'll, I'll say, fuck off. Right. It starts playing in my mind, you know. It's like, a, it's the ego. Yeah. You know, because it, when it comes through you, it comes from a higher source. When it comes from you, it is from ego. So you have to be able to differentiate both. Yes, yeah. If you, and that's how I've been able to survive this business that is not exactly, you know, it's not a party. It's a very difficult business to have a, and succeed in having a, a life. And, and uh, I think, I remember a woman, I had, I don't know, 400 fans come for dinner one one time at a club. Damn. And um, they were asking me questions and all that. And there was a woman in front I was noticing. She was kind of interesting. She came backstage and she was a psychic. She said, I loved the first two hours that when you spoke because it was, information was coming through you to, the, to us, for us. And then your ego came into it because yeah. you're feeling so good about yourself and the adulation and all that. And what happened to you then? Then the ego started to yeah. infiltrate. So if you can get the difference, is this coming from my ego or is this coming through me? If it's coming from your ego, it's going to try and trip you. The, it's the ego that always... Beautifully said. And I'm... My ego has kicked my ass... And I think I'm still chopping away at it. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm at a pretty good place now. But boy, I mean, you talk about three manic episodes, a ton of anxiety, a lot of depression. And a lot of that is two things. That kind of caring about what people think mm -hmm. and ego, which is kind of similar Yes. Right? And if you can work on that, how I feel now is so free. Because I'm not having, you know, it takes so you work. you something. Yes. 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 Yeah. And, but I've always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who looks in the mirror. But I think a lot of times, Teo, I've looked in the mirror and then forgot it. And that's why I keep having the problems. Mm -hmm. Where now, for two years, I told you, it's been really good. So I think I'm looking in the mirror a lot and always... You're probably also developing. Yes. Through experience. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, we're here to get to understand what, what we brought in and how to work with it. And a lot of people are afraid of what they find out. Yeah. I mean, I have friends... My greatest friends have gone. They were older than me because I always liked older people because they knew more than I did. And now I look around to see what remains and that's not particularly gratifying to me anymore because I see the short short um, edges that people take yeah. to get to somewhere yeah. so they don't have to feel the pain of it. Um, I'm just very... We're just in a world where we don't care. You can see yes. how much people are going through the pain of, of, of existence these days. Yeah. And, and, and the amount of kids now that are being brought up on such shallow experiences and um, the distractions, the reason why people can't stay with something long enough. They look at, they, they don't read a book, they'll look at, a short story, a yeah. TikTok, a, a headline, yeah. and that's their conversation. I get you. So uh, to me, um, when I just came back from Australia, 
I realize that there are, I have a lot of nieces and nephews, 45 first cousins, but I thought a lot of them are not very happy. And I thought the reason why is they haven't done the inner work. And I think this, this whole period of three years that we had COVID was a life that was brought to us because it, we had to slow down. Yeah, we were going so fast that we weren't paying attention to what it was we were doing. What we were exactly, causing. exactly. So then we had to go within because there was nothing else, and a lot of people found out it was empty. Yeah, there wasn't things. You know, to me, it's it's what do you ha- what do you have in your refrigerator? Right. You know, if it's empty, there's it's, you can't eat. So you, you, what is your source? Yeah. Uh, of where you go when times are tough because life is about transition. And so it is, yes. And so I feel like uh, because I knew what mentoring did, I feel like I need to go where I can use it, and yeah. that's going back home, where success makes you. Because they say, "Oh, if you've made it, therefore you know, you know some secrets I don't." And so you know, I looked at my nephew who's succeeding so well, and he says, "You've been such an inspiration." And I said, "Why?" And it wasn't until. I did an interview with Craig Bennett in, in Sydney recently, and he said to me, oh, what's it like? You're the first Australian that went to America and made it big in daytime and gave people excuses to come over and um, see if they could succeed as well. So if you find a formula that works for you, it's not going to be the same formula you're going to tell somebody yeah. else. You become an example of it. Yeah. And so they can find whatever it is they need to take. And so I have uh, a few nephews who are doing very well because m- I left. Because people used to ask me, why did you leave Australia? I said, because I needed a mentor. I wasn't getting it from my family. And I was tired of being Greek. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to go. And America to me was... The most gracious, of course, think, the most giving country in the world, it still is, if you're willing to. to yeah. To you can't. It's not free. No. You know. No. And also, when they asked me at the end of the interview, what is it you'd like to tell us now at the end of this time in your life? What would you like to say? I said I would love to be able to. I said I heard a a, a black actress go to a movie recently, and she said, for the first time, I saw me up there. And I said, you know, I don't see me in Australian movies. The movies you produce are all Anglo-Saxon. Everybody's Anglo. You look at the major movie stars, they're all blonde, fair, yeah. basically. Yeah. But I said, you don't have any of the melting pot that exists in Australia, that is the life in Australia. And I would like to see, go to the screen and say, oh, I could have played that. That Oh, they yeah. understand my version of life. But they don't. I said, that's what I'd like to see. But we're still young. I said, you're seeing that happening in America... I mean, the diversity is right. Being yes, accepted They're completely. Yeah, you know, it wasn't when I first came over. No, things have changed oh, anyway. for, for the better. Yeah. And okay, listen. Um, I think we've everything that I wanted to talk about, and I would just want to say, Teo. It was very. He's very interesting to watch. And I love that because I don't have to do much work. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I could just I could just <laughs> just stare at him. Uh, if, have you tell a story? <laughs> exactly. Have you ever noticed that people can't, can't tell stories? I know and, that, and, and they butt in when you're telling a story because yeah, yeah. they're not listening. No, no. And I have a friend who says, uh, "Please listen because I have questions afterwards." <laughs> yeah. and so. It, it it gets to the point is how do you tell a story and yeah. are you listening to who you're yes. talking to? You know? So listen, I appreciate this interview. Oh, me too. I'm so happy you came. And uh my son wanted to but he's sleeping. He wanted to talk to you about traveling. Oh. But maybe some other time. You can call me. I'll call you, yeah. Because he's all into it. Like I was when you were talking about all that stuff I was into. Where does he want to go? I don't know, just, he, and he wants to go all over, like you. How old is he? He's 18. Oh, that's the best. He's an actor, and he's, he's you know, he's got it all. So I'll, we'll call you on FaceTime or something. Mm. All right, sorry, I'm sorry, state of mind audience. We don't want to bore you with this stuff. Thank you, Teo. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. State of mind. Adios. You're a pleasure. Thank you.
That was good, man.